Everyone, welcome to uh, Just So Stories for AI. Um, I'm Sam. I work on uh, the machine learning infrastructure team at Stripe. Uh, and what my team does is we build tech that helps other engineers build models to catch fraud. Um, we'll go into this more, but that's, that's all you need to know for now about me. Uh, so the outline of the talk is we're going to go into that. We're going to go into some techniques for detecting fraud. Uh, we're going to go into some of the choices you can make when you're an engineer who's attacking this problem. Uh, the typical thing you hear, there are interpretable models that you can understand, and then there are these black box, like super accurate, like neural networks, random forests, things like this. They're just hard to get, but they get the job done. Uh, so we're going to talk about why that's not necessarily true. Some of the most complicated models often are the most explainable. Um, I'm going to anchor that with a technique we use at Stripe. I, I think it's novel, but a technique we use at Stripe to make very accurate predictions on fraud for our customers and then offer them an explanation of why this you know, insane model did what it did. Uh, whether it's a true explanation or not, you know, that, that's up to you. There's, there's a number of ways to interpret this. Uh, and finally, we're going to talk about why this is an important problem, why this might be like the most important thing you could be thinking about now if you work in these systems. This is the door into these, like I have to say, the AI safety thing, into ethics and morality and free will and you know, all this stuff, um, all those things. OK, so this is, uh, you know, let, let's, let's talk about you. Uh, you are, you know, you're young. You've always wanted to start a business. You love animals. Uh, you're, you're itching to sort of affect the world in some way. Uh, but you're a little lost. You're browsing Reddit one day, and you come across this photo. So you realize that, like, yeah, this is real. Like, people have this thing they're doing where they're grooming their dogs into geometric shapes. And this is, like, just crushes you. You know, you realize you found your life's purpose. You are going to stop this from happening. Um, <laughs> so you come up with a business plan. Uh, you, you're going to take money. You're going to uh, put it into ad campaigns or something. It's going to go to the dogs. Love and happiness is going to come out the other side. Um, and this is my pitch for what Stripe is, if you don't know. Stripe is a company that makes it so easy to start a company and take money from people that even this idea can be a wonderful, legit business. Um, uh, really, Stripe, that is what Stripe is, but Stripe is also a company that develops tools for people working with money. You shouldn't have to worry about it. Fraud detection is one of those components that we have. So you're humming along, things are going great. You're, uh, I guess, accepting some number of donations. Then fraud strikes. Um, you start seeing in your dashboard charges that don't really make sense. Uh, they're, they all, and this happens to donate, <laughs> this is the purpose for the example, sites that take donations often see a kind of fraud called card testing, where people will, you know, download from the internet, like, a big list of uh, card numbers, um, or just, like, try them, which seems insane, but if you let them get through, it'll work. And they just start running like $1 donations on donation sites. They're taking advantage of your love for these, these puppies uh, to test out cards. And the goal is to come up with like cards that pass the dollar donation so they can go use them somewhere else and steal money. Um, this is not good for you. This keeps you up. Uh, if you hit 1% or so, you're going to start to get, you know, have issues with, um, with, I guess, Visa or card issuers, but through Stripe. So you pick this component off the shelf. This is the thing I work on. This is a component called Radar. So Radar is what Stripe gives you to uh, stop fraud. So uh, yeah, again, I build infrastructure that kind of sits behind this thing. So the main weapon you have is this, this, these rules. So you're able to write rules that will you know, effectively either block, allow, or put into a review queue different charges. So a rule is a model. A rule is the first model we're going to look at today. And we're going to develop this concept. Uh, a, a rule is a model with a built-in explanation. So it's a model in that you put in information about the charge, so things you know. They get compared to these rules. Uh, in this case, if the card is a prepaid card and it's over a $1,000 charge and it's not from the US, go ahead and block it. So the input is those three features they're called, and the output is a decision to block or not. Uh, and on the bottom, you have some stats about what would have happened if you deployed this rule into, into production to block your charges. So again, the question then is, how do you come up with these things? Um, accuracy is not enough. 
typically fraud rates are low. You're not going to get, you know, what, what this picture shows, we have fraudulent charges in the gray area on the left. We've got legitimate charges on the right. And this circle in the middle is like let, just some rule, let's say, that in this case is getting some fraud and getting some non-fraud. So like when you come up with these rules, you're not in your head thinking about accuracy. Because if you have 1% of your charges as fraud, you get like 99% accuracy out of the box. It's, it's nice, it sounds nice, but you're not catching anything. Again, this is if you decided to do no rules. Um, what you're really trying to do is optimize these two metrics that I'm gonna introduce now, because uh, we need them later. Uh, one of them, the idea is that you want your rule to be specific enough that it only lives on the left side of this. So your rule circle, you want to move left. You wanna catch when your rule you know, does its thing, only fraud, right? The problem is that fraud doesn't have like a really obvious, there's no algorithm for detecting fraud. You're just kind of looking at patterns and guessing. So you might say, you know, dollar charges from this place. That, the more specific you get, the more charges you're gonna hit, but the less overall fraud you're gonna catch. So you kind of play this game with yourself where you're coming up with a bunch of rules, each of which lives in this left side. Overall, you wanna cover as much of it as possible, but you wanna try not to block good charges. So that first idea is called precision. How precise is your, is your rule? How precise is your decision? How, like, if you have this sort of one shot, one kill, like, that's a precise rule. And recall is how much of your overall fraud you catch with a rule. So, anyway. Um, why is this not a great solution? Like, the reason why is that fraud evolves, right? So, you come up with a rule, it's a great rule, you really like, you read on the internet, basically you did your SEO homework for fraud, uh, you deploy the rule and suddenly people stop like pasting their credit cards. They write a little script that just types the number in. Okay, your rule fails. Meanwhile, you're still catching the stuff that was on the right before that we cared about. So fraud is adapting all the time. You know, in your little example of your business, now you're spending all your time in the dashboard just being suspicious of everything. Like, this is not a good situation. So how can we make this better? Uh, there's, only one exam there's only one answer to this question. The answer is to sprinkle machine learning on the problem. Um, so thank you, XKCD. Uh, the answer is um, basically to bring in more powerful models that can work on the data we have behind the scenes. So this is what, again, this is kind of the full product of radar. You have rules, and then you have us working to do what we can to lessen that load and catch fraud. So, like, what's ideal here? How do we want to use machine learning? Ideally, we would catch all fraud, right? And ideally, for every charge we block, we would offer up an explanation of why we did that. And as we saw, I'll keep reiterating this, a rule has a built-in explanation where, why did you block the charge? Well, because you told me to. Um, this is less obvious as we move on to all of the different options for machine learning models that you can possibly grab. So this is a, a heat map. Uh, Basically, the darker something is, the more it's able to kick the butt of other models. The higher up you are, the more accurate your models are. Uh, the lower, you know, often there's this correlation between models lower on this list are more interpretable, models higher up are more accurate. So you have this tension here that often people talk about. Um, I just have to say, when I, found, when I made this slide, I was surprised to see that there's a passive-aggressive model for from the bottom. I don't know what this is. Um, <laughs> Come find me afterward and tell me if you do. Uh, so, you know, to anchor this, let's talk about the decision tree right in the middle. So again, a model is a function, a little Scala code, a model is a function from features, so things you know about the world, to some prediction of fraud, right? Ideally, like, this is what you want to be able to ask for every charge that comes in. How likely is it that this charge looks like fraud that we've seen before? How do you implement this function? you can't just sort of write it. There's no obvious way to do this. So a machine learning model, this function, the process of training a machine learning model is the process of using a bunch of your data you have to basically implement that function for you. So you take your training algorithm, you take a data set, you try to soak up as much information and meaning out of this as possible, and the, the result of the training algorithm is a model, which again is a function that hopefully will, in this case, when you pass it in these red charges, so as these things come through the pipeline, you want a high number, a high probability of fraud 
out for those charges and a low for the other ones. So you want a model that matches the patterns that were in your data before. Again, they might change, but the better your model is, the more accurate, the better at soaking up all this meaning, the more you're gonna catch these very, very subtle edge cases that rules just, just can't grab. Um, okay, so decision trees. Uh, a decision tree is kind of the second model we're looking at after rules. We'll talk about how this is actually a collection of rules, but what a decision tree is, is it's like a 20 questions game, basically. Like, you make this thing, your features come in the top, you follow the questions, and what's at the end, what's at the, the leaves of the tree, is a percent chance that it's basically of the charges that you, of the things you look the most like, how many of those were fraudulent, right? And what you're looking for here is you want every path down this tree to be as specific or as precise as possible. So you want it to be that there's a very high confidence or a very low confidence. Basically, you want to be very sure once you've walked all these branches. And overall, you want every charge to sort of find a slot in the tree. So in this case, uh, what, what's nice about this choice of model, say we were to pick this and we were to implement this behind the scenes to be kind of the backing of our machine learning, right? We have this beautiful property that every path through the tree is also a rule. Right? So if we, show, if we block fraud for the user, we can then present to them this explanation of why we did this. We can say, you know, if you had taken this rule, that's the particular path through the tree, and if you had deployed it at this time, it would also have caught this fraud. So right now, like, if the amount in USD is above 20, this is the kind of most, the leftmost branch in the, uh, in the tree. Um, the only difference between these two is that the rule just straight up blocks or doesn't block. There are these uh, probabilities at the edge of the leaves. All you need to do to turn a decision tree into a set of rules is just pick a threshold. You just sort of, behind the scenes, choose something and you deploy it that way. Um, okay, so a decision tree. What's good about decision trees? Decision trees are interpretable. Decision trees, like, what does this mean? It means that you can simulate the algorithm yourself. So you've got your function. You kind of have some trust if that works. That's, you know, your precision, your recall, but you can then look inside the black box and you can just run the algorithm through for any charge that comes in. Um, so every decision has this built-in explanation. And for a product, this is important. For radar, this is important because you have to have uh, trust with the user, right? If we just start, we'll look at an example of what happens as we get more accurate and less explainy. Um, but if you just start blocking charges that are really subtle, you might be right, but people aren't gonna know why you're doing it and they're gonna be suspicious that you're blocking good charges and stopping their business. So this is kind of the trade-off. This is why explanations matter in the fraud context. Um, so not a black box. Okay, so why are decision trees, like what's not good about this? Um, shallow trees just aren't very accurate. Like things are complicated in life, sorry. Like two decisions is often not enough to explain like why something is fraud. So if, if you wanna be accurate with these things, you have to grow them really, really deep. You have to have a lot of branches. And the problem then is like a really deep uh, decision tree is not very explainable, right? Like if you show someone a rule that's 50 or 100 or 1,000 predicates long, it's just, it's insane. It's never gonna work. They, they conceivably could have written it, but there's no way to hold this in your head. Um, the other problem is that the deeper a tree gets, the more it overfits to the data it saw. In the, in the sort of crazy case, every single row of your training data can just be a path in the tree. And the problem with that is like, your new fraud probably won't look exactly like your old fraud, and so you've frozen this moment in time of what your training data looked like, it's probably not gonna apply to anything in the future, which is the whole point of all this. Final problem is that we know a lot more about users behind the scenes than we are really like, okay, releasing. So, uh, there's an 80% chance that Stripe has like seen a card if it shows up, even if you just launched your business. So, you know, we can't really expose certain pieces of data like, oh, this is a really unlikely purchase for this user to have made at this time of night from this kind of business. Here's what they usually do. Like, this information can't leak out. We don't want that to be part of the explanation. So we're a little shackled if we only use decision trees, right? Okay, so we gotta go higher up. We gotta go to a higher floor. Um, Decision trees right there in the middle. Uh, we'll talk next about random forests. So random forests are like second from the top. This is what we actually use. Uh, this is a generalization of the decision tree idea. 
And I'm gonna go through how it works. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna go through how it works, it's kinda wild, just to give you an idea of what it means when people say that a random forest is a black box, that it's hard to, underst it's hard to understand why it's doing what it's doing. Um, okay, so the random forest. Uh, the idea here is that you, the intuition here is you have your data, you build a decision tree, okay, that's fine. If you had more data, if you just had many, many data sets, you could build, and you built a ton of decision trees, maybe that would be a more accurate way to assess what's going on, right? If Stripe had 200 times the data, maybe we'd be able to grab 200 times, uh, you know, the info out of it. So th there's a statistical technique to deal with this, it's called bootstrapping. I still don't really have my head around, like, why this isn't just an insane technique that should not work. The idea is you just, like, sa randomly sample the data you have. And each time you do this, roughly you'll end up, you'll duplicate some stuff, you'll miss some stuff, you'll end up with roughly like two thirds of the amount of data you had going into every time you do this bootstrap sampling. But you can pull as many samples as you want. So the idea is you just keep doing that. You just randomly sample your data and you just keep training decision trees as deep as you want. These, these you know, enormous trees trained out of your data. And you just keep going and going and going. And beyond that, each tree, you only send some random subset of the features that you knew about. So you don't tell every tree everything. You don't give it the opportunity to fork on every possible thing. You just pick, it's typically like the square root of the number of features, you just randomly send off a batch. Final thing, when you have a prediction, how does the function work? So this is the kind of why, the simulatability question. You take your features, you ask every tree what it thinks, and then when you're done, you just average all the answers together. And this turns out to be like really, really accurate. Um, sort of strangely, I would say. Uh, it's very flexible. It'll pick up on patterns in the data that are you know, very, very subtle and that a decision tree would overfit on. And you can basically just keep cranking up the number of trees and keep making them better. Um, so this is good. The con is like you can't simulate this. It's a black box, right? I was wondering if I'd get a chuckle on this. This is like the only place maybe that <laughs> I could break this out. Okay, so it, why is it a black box? Like, it's a black box because it's not simulatable. That's typically what people mean, I would say. Um, why is it not simulatable? One model we have out now at Stripe has a couple hundred trees. Each tree has 12,000 splits, so 12,000 possible decisions. This is two, uh, right, let's do the math. Two and a half million possible explanations of why this charge was fraudulent. So this is like not okay, right? This is like asking someone why they, you know, why they pushed you down the stairs or something and they just give you a print out of the entire state of their brain at that time. Like, <laughs> that's the explanation, that's it. That's why they did what they did. Totally not okay as a justification. Um, and this is what would happen naively if we don't have a way of explaining these black boxes. I mean, this is, I actually hate this. This is really what we do. If we don't have an explanation, you just say, you know what, there's a lot of contributing factors to the risk level of this payment based on activity across uh, the Stripe network. There's a lot of stuff. It's a, it's a complicated world out there. Just, just relax, just trust the model. <laughs> it's kind of patronizing and it, it doesn't really work when you also have these rules that are so inefficient and not good, but I, it's just, it's such a beautiful story. I just want to believe it. Um, so what we want is something like this. This is a little bit better, right? You want something that, like, this is an explanation that says this card, here's the last four numbers, has been linked to a large number of attempted payments across the Stripe network over the last hour. Like, oh my God, that kind of sounds like fraud. Like, I don't know if it is. I, I'm not sure if that's the real reason, but if that's what the model thought, I'll go with it. Um, another one here. It's been used from an unusually large number of IP addresses across the Stripe network over the last 24 hours. So this is an explanation generated off of a random forest model that kind of explains, it, it has some truth to it. It is true. Whether it was kind of the reason the forest did what it did, I'll talk about how we came up with it and just keep this in your mind and see, see whether you agree that this makes sense. So how do you do this? The technique we use to generate these is a technique called post hoc explanations. The idea is you just kind of give up on any idea that you could simulate the model. You just treat it as a black box. You treat it as that wonderful pure function that it is. Just forget about it. 
and you train another little model that bolts onto it and tries to explain why it's doing what it's doing, right? And so, like, the intuition behind why this is easier is, I don't know what to bring up, like, conspiracy theories or, but it's, it's really hard to make real predictions, but once something happens, like, everybody's got a story for why the thing happened, right? Or, I guess another, another way to get this across is this, I guess my mom will say to me, like, oh, what are the chances of these people running into each other? Oh, you know, after the fact, the chance is 100%. And you can come up with any story you want to explain why it happened, right? So we're, we're explaining what the model's doing, but we have this lower effort task in front of us, right? Um, okay. So we, uh, we started with this paper. It's called the Model Explanation System. It's fantastic. The, the concepts it puts out are great. I, I was totally bowled over. I have no idea what's going on, like, deep in this paper. So we, we sort of were inspired by the paper. And we, uh, Avi Bryan, Eric Osheim, and my team, uh, extracted from this paper a method of explaining black box models, which we'll go over now. Um, so uh, the intuition here, like, that came from this paper is what is an explanation? It's like we talked about before, like for a black box model. An explanation is a rule that had you deployed it would also have caught the same charge and possibly would have agreed with the model on a lot of other charges, right? So its precision is high. Every, every explanation's precision is high. And the advantage is that we can generate a ton of possible explanations. And then when a charge comes through and we know what the model said, then we can do the conspiracy theory thing and turn around and pick the one that we like the most. Picking ahead of time is really hard. Once you know what happened, it's easy. Um, OK, so let's build up to how we do this. Uh, the intuition here is that, as we talked about, every path through these trees is a rule, right? So there's like <laughs> millions of possible explanations here. So we do what any good statistician would do. We just start sampling these possible explanations. Any one of them might work well, and any, anything goes, right? So we just we use the tree as a, a sort of a source of possible explanations. Um, every split in the tree we'll call a predicate. Uh, so the name here is the name of the feature that the split operates on. The operation is like greater than, less than, uh, equals, doesn't equal, super simple. And then the constant is what the value is. So you can check if something's in a category, you know, is the country in this bucket, et cetera. Um, so for example here, unique card, IP address in, 20, in the last 24 hours, that's how many times has this card been used uh, from the same IP address in the last 24 hours. So this predicate says that's greater than 10, great. Uh, so an explanation, like we said, is a list of these things. A list that are all true, so you're, you're, uh, you, you and them all together. Um, and they're sorted by how precise they are. And precision here, again, is, I find the word, like, I find the word confusing, but the idea simple, so I'll just keep saying it and saying it, and then maybe you'll absorb it. Um, precision, again, is like, for explanations, if the explanation applies to a charge, how many of those calls did the, the, you know, the big, the black box model also make? If it's 100% precision, that means that this explanation may be applied to a small number of charges, but every one of them agreed with the model, right? Um, if you have low precision, that means you don't agree at all. There's not a good explanation. Uh, so the structure of an explanation model, as we said, is a list of explanations sorted by their precision. Uh, so every explanation, what we want out of this system is we want to just come up with stuff, just make up explanations, each one of which has high precision, so applies to some subset of the charges very well. And then we can just keep generating explanations until we get coverage over everything, until we get high recall. The idea being that for every fraudulent charge or for every positive example, there's some explanation that we can pull. Um, okay. This is the most dense slide I have, and like, this kind of sucks, but just bear with me. This is the algorithm to do it. I, ha I, I, got, it, I got to do it for this talk, but um, it's, it's less like, don't think you're supposed to memorize this, because obviously nobody will. The goal is just to show how like, weird and arbitrary this is and how unrelated this is to the idea of simulating a model that we had before. Yet the result is actually pretty good and kind of makes sense. So, okay. The idea is first you just generate a ton of possible predicates. So you, you just have your set of examples, you start moving through the tree and just, just picking things out of your millions of possible ones, right? Step two is you weight them all by the precision they have. So you weight them by how much they agree with the model. 
given some like lower level of recall. So the idea is if you've got something that perfectly predicts one example, this is not very helpful. Very high precision, not good. Uh, finally, you pick like a thousand of those weighted by their precision. So you sample those, you set those aside, so you have n of these things, you have a thousand of these things, and you go ahead and you, you take the, uh, you do, you get the n by n like possible two predicate explanations out of this. This is, by the way, why you can't just sort of try everything, because once you start multiplying these and getting longer explanations, things go to hell quickly. Um, so you get your, you get your top thousand, uh, you go make your, you know, million, uh, two level explanations, you go back to step three, you start sampling those weighted by their precision. And you just keep going at this. And you go as kind of deep as you can expect people to understand. Uh, we don't like, you know, target that per merchant, like everybody is, you know, there's, there's no one who's like specially targeted to handle like a 20 level deep explanation. Um, six t tends to be the limit of people's, uh, people's patience. So you end up with 6,000 possible explanations, right? And then you go through and you sort all those by their precision, you pick one, and then the final step is you go back into your set of calls that the model made, and you, like, everything that your explanation explained, you flip back from fraud to not fraud. So you remove it from your data set. And then you go back and you do it again. And you do this like 80 times. So there's this insane uh, process of just trying out a bunch of stuff that is not tied really to like the reality of whether something's fraud or not. You're just trying out these plausible, like potentially plausible scenarios and trying to find the most plausible thing that fits your model's explanation. And it takes a long time. Uh, but what you end up with is that, you know, list of explanations, any one of which could apply to a new charge that comes in. Okay. So internally in our systems, what does this let us do? What this lets us do is whenever a charge comes in, we're able to give a prediction for all the features we know about the charge. We're able to give, you know, a threshold. Uh, and then we can supply this list, this, this explanation, which is a list of these predicates, right? So why was the prediction 48%? Well, the real answer is all the connections between the neurons and who knows what the hell's happening. But a plausible explanation that might also explain the same behavior is that, you know, the card was used on more than 10 IP addresses in the last day. Uh, the billing country did not match the card country, and it was a MasterCard. Obviously. Um, and then we, we dilute it a little more. Like, you could just show this, but we dilute it a little more. We just take the, the top thing, which is the most precision, um, and we go ahead and we render it. We just have, like, a, you know, template for every one of these. So this becomes, you know, it strips out even more information and says, this is an unusually large number of, uh, of IP addresses that this, this card was used from. Um, okay, so... <laughs> In, like, it, this always makes me uncomfortable to think about, because in, in what sense, like, is this an explanation of what the model's doing? Like, there's no mention of the truth here. Uh, we're not talking about, like, you could just as easily, let, let's put it this way, you could just as easily train an explanation model on the false positives of the real model, and you could offer someone, this is not a product anyone will take at Stripe, I think, you could also give someone, like, your plausible reason about why the model might be wrong, you know? So this explanation for why you might want to doubt the machine learning tech. That's totally fine, too. Like, the explanation machinery does not care what the truth is. It's just trying to predict, it's just trying to justify, I guess, what's going on behind the scenes. Um, so I think of these as just-so stories. Uh, this, story, this is the story of how the elephant got his trunk. Um, it had nothing to do with evolution. The elephant uh, got into a battle with alligator or crocodile who grabbed its trunk and stretched it so far that now it's long. And it seems kind of plausible to me. It's a fantastic just-so story. Um, so we're going to talk about next a few other ways in which black box models are explainable, but just kind of chew on this idea that this is an explanation, but it's designed to be a persuasive explanation that's not tied to what's actually going on inside the model, whatever that means. Um, you can explain anything well, even if there are systematic errors underneath that you might be missing. Um, so the final comment on this is it's like a totally inappropriate technique by itself. A user should only trust this 
if they have some reason to believe that inside Stripe or whatever organization, somebody else is working hard to ensure that the model is actually being accurate and fair, right? So let's explore that. Um, so the observation here, what we're gonna go into and what this, the model we just talked about reveals is that black box models are explainable uh, in certain ways. They have much richer internal representations than a simple model like a decision tree. So overall, the question of like, why did the model do what it do, do what it did? It's not really answerable uh, globally because it's meant to absorb information from huge amounts of training examples. But you can learn a lot. You can explain individual decisions very, very well. Uh, there's a technique called LIME, which it's got a great Python library. It's a, it stands for locally interpretable model explanations. LIME is based on this idea that, you know, what a, what a black box model is doing is it's carving up, uh, a classifier anyway, it's carving up the, the boundaries between fraud and non-fraud in this very, very complex nonlinear way in the feature space, right? So you've got this incredibly complicated function, but what that means is that for any individual example, you're pretty likely to be close to some decision boundary, right? So the, the idea here is, you know, what would have to change about the individual charge that would make it go from fraud to not fraud, right? So, so you can, if you have this black box with a rich internal representation, you can just start asking it all these questions. Um, and you can get out a pretty nice answer. And this, this has a beautiful, um, <laughs> Like, image data is really nice for this, right? Because there's no way even our old explanation system would work where the features are individual pixels. But, okay, so here's, here's an example from the Lime paper, right? This is a husky that was classified as a wolf. Uh, raise your hand if you think this is like a good classification. I mean, it's a, it's a misclassification, but like, do you kind of get why it did what it did? So, right, like, it kind of makes sense. So, an explanation for an image is the pixels that if they were different, would most affect the outcome of the decision, right? So for this, oh man, you know, the, the explanation is actually the snow around the face. <laughs> totally not obvious. Again, you have this machinery for coming up with explanations. It turns out that in your training data, you had a lot of wolves sitting in the snow and a lot of huskies on couches or whatever, right? <laughs> so, so this one example kind of invalidates, say you worked on this for a few months, it's like crushes your life, but <laughs> it just tells you everything about what you need to do to go make the model better. Um, so in that, this cannot happen for a simple model. Uh, another example here, using the same software, by the way, um, this is uh, prediction probabilities of whether this email was from, uh, like, I think these are from Usenet uh, mailing lists. So whether it's like an atheist or a Christian list. So it gets it right, it's like, Wow, we're talking about Darwin fish. These are, these are some atheists right here, I'll tell you that. Um, why did it do it? Well, there's a 15% of the decision was from the word posting. Uh, host contributed another 14%. Like, not helpful, right? You've, you've overfitted heavily on this aspect of your training set. Um, and only a, a black box model is sort of able to be explained in this way. Final one, we gotta go, but it's not really tied to my thread, but it's just so awesome. Um, another, there's this technique called AI rationalization. The idea is you just, you go back to the first sort of thing, you disconnect any meaning in the model from uh, what's happening, and you try to get, say a model that's playing like a game like Frogger, you try to get it to explain what it's thinking at that point in the game, right? So an example of the output of this, <laughs> This is an AI that can play Frogger, it's gotten to the logs, and so it's like printing out its stream of consciousness. So it says amongst the logs, dang, this is hard. I need frogging to avoid death from the edges. Um, it's, it's beautiful. Um, there's a great paper that talks about a lot of this, it's called The Mythos of Model Interpretability, and it, it discusses this case of how black box models are often much more uh, available to be examined. Um, but a strange thing comes up uh, when you read these papers, you get these comments about like humans being black box models that have post hoc explanations only, right? So human decisions might admit post hoc interpretability despite the black box nature of human brains, revealing a contradiction between two popular notions of interpretability. Like, this is what we've been talking about, but the human mention's a little startling. Um, uh, Peter Norvig, who wrote the book on AI, 
has a similar comment in his article on how he questions the value of explainable AI. Um, he says, you can ask a human what they're doing, but you don't really have any insight into their decision-making process. They do what they do, and then they just make up something. They make up some BS. Uh, as you dig deeper in this rabbit hole, this is an example some of you may have heard of. Um, this is supported by the research. Uh, in, uh, Roger Sperry in 68 has a bunch of studies on um, split-brain patients. This is a case where you have someone with grand mal seizures. The only way to relieve these seizures that sort of rip across both hemispheres of the brain is to cut the corpus callosum. So you totally isolate both hemispheres. And bear with me if you've seen this. It's just so weird and awesome. The experiment you can do then is you, you, you block someone's visual field, right? Your left and right eyes are connected to different hemispheres. You flash the word egg in front of someone's left eye. Uh, their right eye can't see it. You ask them what they saw, and they say, I didn't see anything. Nothing happened, right? And then you say, okay, well, reach behind the screen with your left hand and pick out the thing you didn't see. Okay, that doesn't make any sense, but let's do it. Most of the time, people pick the egg when they've seen the word egg, right? And then you say, what are you holding? And the person says, I, I don't know. I, I can't tell. I just picked up an object, right? You show it to them, and you say, why did you do that? Why did you pick the, the egg in your hand? And every time somebody has some BS explanation, like, well, I, I had eggs for breakfast this morning. Like, I must have done that. What's, what's really happening is, I mean, there seems to be no other way to explain this except you have these two independent seats of consciousness in your mind, right? And your right hemisphere is doing the thing. It has memory. It's conscious. And you're just sort of watching it. The part of your brain that's responsible for language is watching what's happening and trying to take ownership of the decisions. Very weird. Um, so... The, uh, the sense you get reading about uh, models and realizing that you are a model. Um, <laughs> this movie's 20 years old. I can't explain this joke if you don't get it. <laughs> you just have to see it. It's so crazy at the end. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, this is, this is an important, uh, like, quote, concluding thing. There, this book, Homo Deus, is, is brilliant and lays out that there's like an ism behind this idea. The idea is that we are on the same playing field, or the assumption in these comments is that we're models, you know, these, these machine learning models are models, we're on the same playing field, and we're rapidly becoming outdated, right? Like, everything is information, everything is algorithms. Uh, the whole point is to make better decisions. Why should it matter whether we're the ones making them or not? Um, so, I mean, we did this with driving, right? Like, in a few years, humans are not going to be driving. Like, you're not going to put an ape behind the wheel when you can have a, a car uh, driven by an algorithm. So once you get the goals right, like, why not give in? Why try to explain your models? Uh, often what people justify, like, this line of thinking is often accompanied by this thought that, like, uh, this is a harmful restriction on these models, right? Like, uh, there's a metaphor from a, a book by Max Tegmark that, Imagine yourself as an adult living amongst four or five-year-olds. And like everything you do about farming and getting food and like creating society, you have to find a way to explain to these like little four-year-olds running around. Like at some point, this is just going to become totally tedious. And if only you could just realize, like, just go do what you needed to do and not have to explain it, your shackles would be broken. Um, you see comparisons all the time to medicine. It's a technology that we don't really get in a lot of cases, but it would be immoral to withhold antibiotics. Um, so I think the crux of the answer to this sort of critique of explanations, of needing explanations, is the question of uh, goals, right? Like, for most things today, we don't encode, we don't know how to encode everything we care about in the goals of a model. So uh, this is the, uh, another quote here, in the rush to gain acceptance for machine learning and to emulate human intelligence, we should be careful not to reproduce pathological behavior at scale. So explanations are important because they help us clarify what we care about. There are things that, there are objectives we have that if we don't encode them in the goals of a model, the model's not going to care. It doesn't know anything about meaning, right? So um, explanations are almost the tether we have uh, on maintaining some relevance rather than just letting things spin off into meaninglessness. Um, so explanations are the crux of a lot of approaches to AI safety research. DARPA's got a program. Berkeley has the Center for Human Compatible AI. There's a NIP symposium on this. There's just so much. Like, people are honing in on this. Um, and uh, 
a, a big thing that I've been thinking about lately is the, there's a, this is a paper about it, but uh, the EU's general data protection regulation has put into law this idea that you have a right to an explanation from an algorithm that makes decisions about, uh, about your life. So an explanation is a civil right uh, from this point of view. Now, I hope that in this talk, we've talked about a few kinds of explanations. You'll see that this is, it, it, it's not obvious. This is a good idea, but it's not obvious that this is the solution or that this is gonna do what people think. Um, Norvig's real point in this, in this essay uh, or in this, this interview was that, you know, say you applies for a loan and gets turned down, whether it's by a human or by a machine. The explanation is not tied to reality. The explanation might be that he doesn't have enough collateral. The right explanation might be something about skin color. You can't tell from the explanation, right? Um, so what he's actually recommending in this, which is the concluding point I have, is that explanations are important, again, as this way to potentially clarify our ethics and what we care about. And as wonderful as these beautiful technologies that can just predict and, and uh, you know, generate efficiency for us are, explanations let us see outcomes, judge by interrogating these black box models uh, whether or not these things are tracking the things we care about in our societies. We can then go bake them back into our models and almost formalize our ethics in a way that we've, we've never really had to. Um, so, in conclusion, we talked about a lot. Uh, we talked about some models. Uh, I hope I've convinced you that black box models are in fact very explainable. Don't trust anybody who tells you otherwise. Um, this is a really interesting accessible area. It's a great window into you know, questions of uh, AI safety. Um, it's something you can be doing now. And I would almost say that if, if you're working with models, like you should be building these into your products. Um, so be suspicious and uh, yeah, come talk to me if you want to know more about this. And thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>